Hey, what's going on everyone? My name is MG The Future. Depending on what day you see this, yes, you're seeing me again. <laughs> um, this video is a short discussion, I hope. Every time I predict something's gonna be short, it never is. But I'm kinda on a time crunch right now, so I have a hunch that I'm just gonna cut it short regardless. But um, the discussion I wanted to talk about inevitably, and I've done glimpses of on Instagram Live with a smaller group of people I kind of wanted to share publicly um, because I think it's going to benefit a lot of people um, and I'm going to try not to be so harsh but I think it's required in terms of what I'm going to describe and I know a lot of people are going to have a gut check where they're going to be in denial to some of the things I'm saying so it's going to probably be not the most popular video I've done but I have to do it um, so it gets off of my mind clear my mind clear my mental space and get ready for the rest of my week um, tomorrow, of course, I have to prepare for the Machine Masters Wednesday. Um, so I'm going to probably knock that out real fast. And then for the remaining of that day, use what I'm going to teach myself to finish another project or that song I have to do with Yish. Since I have spectral layers now, um, there's a few things I can do to uh, make sure that sounds really good and perfectly prepared for my first Spotify track. So probably write that tomorrow. That's probably going to be the motive after the Machine Masters rehearsal kind of thing. But this discussion comes from this comment. It says, MG, you need to stop, man. Too many gems. And this sentiment is said in jest. Like, D. Daniels doesn't really mean that. What he's pointing out, though, is that a, a lot of the stuff I share and teach um just opens up a lot of mental possibilities and a lot, unlocks a lot of doors for people. And um, I appreciate the feedback that confirms that for me, rather it been me in a kind of like an insecure, or uncertain space of whether or not I'm actually effective at teaching people. So I appreciate all the kind regards. But I responded to him in a very particular way. I said, knowing is only half the battle. And that's what this discussion should be called the other half of the battle. And I really don't know where to begin on this. So let's talk about what he said. He said, I share so many tips, so many gems with the producers, a lot of cool things, a lot of cool hacks, and basically a whole bunch of stuff. If you're the kind of minded person to just take my word for it and apply it to your production, you're going to see results. Um, I have tons of people who are on the playlist hunt and it's working for them. I have tons of people who are on the Instagram hunt. It's working for them. I have tons of people who are on the production hunt. It's working for them. A lot of cool, useful, good advice that help a lot of people on the level I'm on get to another level, right? I'm bringing everyone up with me at the same time, up to the stair that I'm facing. Now, the other half of the battle is the set of clearance or the set of stairs that's in front of us. And this is the part that many people miss because they're too romantic about creating music. They're too romantic about our reality. They're too romantic about what it takes to make it or lack the self-awareness or lack the ability to accept things as they are rather than as they wish them to be. Um, and we see this manifested in a lot of different ways. For instance, um, <clears throat> trap. We see a lot of old and gold, golden age hip hop producers pushing back against trap. So for the past decade and a half almost, They've been out of significance because they've been pushing it back. The way that it is, is that trap and its subculture took over all the golden era, soulful hip hop and true school and all these things became super irrelevant to the point now that new people making beats have no idea who these people are. That is the uh, side effect of time, but more so instead of them adapting, they held on to their ideal that they cannot, so to speak, sell out. <clears throat> and on one level, you have to respect it where it is in the time where they were relevant. On the other hand, it's kind of like, why didn't they just adapt? Why didn't they bring soul to trap? Why didn't they not collaborate with trap producers and help them get better? Why does it take G Coop and these kind of guys to wave the flag and bring Metro Boomin and TM88 and those type of guys to the forefront in terms of making hit records? Irregardless of the business side, just the musical content, just the uh, ability to have that kind of professionalism in trap beats. 
Why sit on the sideline for that? And then now, as you see it, everyone's rushing at the last minute to now do that. It's like everyone's had this aha moment, like Timberland's reaching out, co-signing younger producers and younger rappers, right? Um, other producers are slowly creaking in, doing the Skypes with other people, right? Other producers are slowly becoming a little bit more social on social media and doing podcast features, right? Everyone's kind of coming into this game at the last minute, and therefore it's going to kind of get worse. N not that this is not, <laughs> this is the perfect time to do that, but this is the last time to do that. So if they forsake the experiences they would have acquired the past decade, they would be able to do this, maintain it, and build it up higher um, to sustain it for a few more years. I do not perceive that most of the people that I'm alluding to can because they don't have the context of where things are going. They're just in a hot moment where the window is almost about to shut. And so many people are trying to go through that little window. Eventually, they're going to break the window. So I guess I'm part of that too, right? But on the, on, on the flip side of all that, what, what I'm hinting at and what I'm alluding to is that the riggedness of people who are set in their ways and a lot of producers and beat makers, based on the questions that I have, um, uh, uh, definitely are set in their ways or your ways or our ways. And a lot of people are clouding the difference between creativity, music, and love and passion with music business. <laughs> the music business on a surface level gives off this perception that anyone who puts in the time, effort, and talent cultivation can be part of it. This is so far from the truth. The music business in America is under democracy and capitalism, just like every other facet in your life. If you've ever worked a job, a nine to five or in corporate America, you know, no matter how hard you work, no matter how you hit the numbers, no matter how you hit the metrics, every other week, you're gonna have another meeting telling you you're not good enough. No matter how much time you put in, no matter, even if you level up and become manager, there's always going to be someone ahead of you telling you to stay on top of your job. And you're going to find out in that particular environment that there's easier ways to do things, smarter ways to do things, people that we should get rid of, people we should recruit. We're understaffed. We need more people. All these other solutions you're naturally are going to come across. And the people above you are going to say no. And it's not going to make sense. It's going to be counterintuitive. You're going to come to a point where you'd be like, well, if you're complaining about these metrics, why don't we fix them over here? And they will be like, don't worry about that. Let's fix them. No, 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 no. If you want me to fix them, do these things. No, don't worry about that. Fix them. It's a canned response is what they call it. Meaning it's BS. Meaning if you're currently in a position like that, ignore them. Um, it's not meant to be fixed because they don't want to spend the money to fix it. So when we talk about the music industry, the reason why the talent pool and the resources and the hit records and the timeless music seems to be lacking is because they do not wish to spend money anymore. So the real complaint is not the trap producers. The real complaint is not anything that you put your finger on. It's actually something very much simpler than all of it is that all these record owners were scared to spend money or were forced to put money into different areas and other businesses that they're chairs and related to. As such, we're starting to see a leak of that kind of information and all these people getting exposed and all these companies crashing and all these policies and the shutdowns and all these things we see in real life out of our safety net of creativity. These people who own these labels are a part of you look at their last names. They're often related to each other or from the same lineage, country or paradigm. So nothing what you can do on your level equates to you changing the game. Because the game is not what we're playing. The game is a different game. And this is when it starts to get dark and I wanna to start to sound a little cynical. <clears throat> we have to remember that hip hop <laughs> was birthed and quickly co-opted and became a vehicle for advertising. All music is a form of advertisement since the beginning of radio. Meaning the music is just there to fill the airwaves long enough for you mom, usually the females, to listen to an advertisement to spend money because this is a money game. And there's a karma attached to that just like there's a karma attached into investing in yourself. You put money in, you get money out. Just like me with information. I get information in, I put it out, I get more information. Same thing with money. You get money, put it out, get money, bounce back. It's a circuit. And regardless of what the logistics is behind it, it just is what it is. So they were putting money into records and art 
in order to get money back through ads. We see this in television, we see this in everything else. So when hip hop came about years later and it became a powerful enough force to uh, influence and motivate youth culture, you know, the generation they think they lost, the generation they don't think they can reach, they started to see that, okay, we need to put money behind this and double down on it because the culture, this generation X that's coming and all these other facets that we normally don't consider on our level um, are going to be met if we put enough attention behind it. And that's when they start picking their own artists. And you're gonna notice a lot of people say the golden era of hip hop was so popular and so positive. This is false. And a lot of people disagree with me because I've had this discussion in real life and Facebook groups. The people we see as legends and icons now were not legendary during that time. In fact, some of the producers in rap groups that we can name today and have love and reverence for weren't even touching Madonna, let alone Michael Jackson, let alone Whitney Houston, let alone any other pop artists during that same time parallel. These were smaller acts in terms of tours, in terms of CDs sold in that time, in terms of awareness and relevance. So mainstream hip hop, early 90s, mid 90s was underground music. So everyone in the underground is always going to have this heart anchor into it because they grew up with it, but it wasn't what it is today in terms of impact. It became that. So during that time period, you notice that they switched those artists out that weren't so popular with the positive message, with the uplifting of urban and inner cities and switched them out for drugs because the advertisement in the music was to sell drugs. And we know this, um, Freeway Rick Ross, not the rapper, the person, the identity, Ricky Ross from Los Angeles. <clears throat> he speaks on this countless. He has a whole book about it. Um, and one thing that stood out to me that he spoke on recently, which kind of coincides with all this, is that he was saying how uh, his drug connect was then connected to the CIA. And of course, they have TV shows about this. FX Networks has Snowfall. We have Pablo Escobar. We have all these other things that are derivatives and run parallel with this man's life, if not about him directly. And this particular Nicaraguan that he, it was his connect um, was being exposed and ran, left the country and was responsible for all, the biggest drug bust in California, or I think it was Miami. Basically, they had a, a submarine dropping uh, drugs into the ocean and they had scuba teams and we started to connect the dots. Um, and I think it was Gary Webb exposed it, wrote the article and it ended up, you know, dead with a double shot to the head suicide type thing. And we all know that's code word for black ops. So the, the Rick Ross himself and who these record labels have a rapper named after, it's pretty much just laid out the whole thing. It's like, yeah, a lot of the money was being laundered for the United States, for the CIA, for these issues of keeping Russia away from our continent. So they got involved with the Contras and all these things. The history lesson, I don't need to dig deep into. He tells the story better anyway. But suffice it to say, that money, the drug culture, had to be advertised in order for the supply and demand to be met. At the time, there's too much supply. So that started to leak into advertisement. Rick Ross himself didn't sell drugs just because he had access or he had the plug. He sold drugs because people wanted to do drugs. And then you have to ask yourself the question, why do people want to do drugs? So hold that, put it aside. Fast forward a little bit. We're gonna see this manifest again in different ways. Let's speak about Rick Ross, the rapper. Rick Ross, the rapper was sued by Ricky Ross as soon as he got out of jail. Rick Ross record label Universal Warner had 15 lawyers assigned to him to make sure that this lawsuit failed. The real Rick Ross lost. He now owes these 15 lawyers on Universal side about a hundred, uh, half a million dollars or a million dollars. Also, Rick Ross does too. Hence, the curious position he finds himself in as a superstar is no longer there because he has to pay his label back for these attorney fees. That has nothing to do with music. That has nothing to do with how good Rick Ross raps. That has nothing to do with the Justice League and how prolific they were at interpolating samples. It had nothing to do with trap music. It had nothing to do with the beef with 50 Cent. It had nothing to do with anything. It had everything to do with the fact that Universal and Warner had to get involved and do damage control and media control 
of this real guy who's the real Rick Ross and him being unexpectedly released from prison to tell his story as it interrupts the narrative that the artistry was painting about drug culture. The real Rick Ross says it's bad. The fake Rick Ross is saying, I did this, I pump weight, I did this, and he doesn't. All he's doing is running advertisements for drugs. Whereas the real drug dealer has remorse about it. <clears throat> and he was exposing different people's involvement. So I had to think and come to the conclusion that these are the same problem. The people who can afford 15 lawyers to make this disappear and make some of you hear this for the first time have to be the same people who profited on this man, the real Rick Ross's existence. Have to be. Because he would be the first one to tell you also that before they locked him up in the 90s, he was going to fund his own record label. And he got this blueprint from the people who did Death Row and the people behind the scenes, not the Shook Knight, but the people behind the scenes, the music people um, and the business people. And they're all connected to drug culture. They're all connected at the same time in California. They're all connected from that same energy circle. So if the people this notorious drug lord was connected to was creating record labels and he went in too, then that had to have been a money laundering angle for the business people, meaning the talent producers and all that stuff, the studios, the lifestyles are just a side effect for them to sell and clean drugs. Therefore, the artists that they signed by default of Pulse, our life force Pulse, had to resonate with what their intentions really were. So if I'm selling a lot of things illegally and I'm profiting and I'm cleaning it, and I'm gonna channel it into something else, it might as well also serve as an advertisement for everything else that I do. We have to keep people in this perpetual cycle of self-destruction in order for me to make more money, clean more money, and now I can sell the record to everyone else. And this is the same exact hustle I describe to people who um, use Spotify, right? You use Spotify to put out your beat tape, and your beat tape can go to rappers, or your beat tape can go to everybody else. Either way, that everybody else can listen to it and tell their rapper cousins and their rapper brothers and their rapper boyfriends that this kid has this dope project, the beats are nice, play it for them. Now you have a rapper running to the store to buy it, to rap on it, to reach out to you. They're two different businesses, but they're the same thing. This is the same thing about music. When you, <laughs> when you dig into our current iteration of music, you're going to see this manifest again. You're going to see it manifest in one hit wonders, they call it. I want you to go through all your favorite one hit wonders. Don't lie, you have some. And I want you to listen to the amount of branding that occurs in their verses and their hooks. Um, Jay-Z is a, a fine example of this. He's not a one-hit wonder, but he's a fine example. Him and Dame Nash, fine example of advertising, right? He came in off the streets from drug culture, so that's all he rapped about. Then Dame Dash and his Harlem hustle started talking about ownership. So he, Jay-Z started rapping about the clothes they would wear, Iceberg and stuff. When that wasn't popping no more and Iceberg started pushing back and saying, basically, you didn't help us sell anything. They did their own rock aware with Mark Echo and all these other guys and the Italian brothers. And now they made this new label. Now they're always doing clothes and rapping about the clothes. They're rapping and making bottles about the bottles that they're sponsoring or were sponsored by until they can afford their own. Every time they had a new business venture, the next album complemented it by becoming a billboard. So when Jay-Z did the Barclay Center or the Nets, that album of that time reflected that. When Jay-Z did whatever, everything reflects that. When Jay-Z did 444, his ownership of title was touched on, right? He's giving back to the community by teaching and talking from his experience and wisdom, which came much later in his life. But at the same time, it's an advertisement for his wife's new album that's coming. You see what I'm saying? So it's always interconnected to a, a ad. And unfortunately for us, they're wired or trained or groomed or exposed to that reality. We're not. We're just hearing Just Blaze. We're just hearing the bars. Our mind is so blind to the apparent BS that we ignore that to get what we want instead. And that's the romance aspect of it. <clears throat> You're not listening to the early 90s going, all these guys were talking about smoking weed. And then Bill Clinton came along and did the three strike thing and demonized marijuana. We weren't going, oh man, all these guys are talking about selling drugs towards the turn of the mid 90s. 
but we weren't talking about the mass incarceration that was the side effect, the desired side effect and the violence and the um, civil unrest and all these different things that became, which allowed people to be gentrified out of neighborhoods because they were self-destructed to the soundtrack of our favorite hip hop. And once that self-destruction went away, the people went away, the people who were left or unaffected, they moved, they sold out low, and now, you know, new things are coming in. And those old meccas for the culture, for the love, for where the romance should have been, are now just like faint shadows and phantoms of what they used to be. And this is all a long con. I've said this word before. For most people, they don't see it that far because they don't look at time like I look at time. They don't think they have time. Sometimes we have more time than we think. These people who control money have to think about time. So it's not a optional thing. It's not a genius. It's not a talent. It is a requirement for being rich to understand time. And these long cons that they play puts everyone into position and very few people adapt. Very few people get initiated and play too. Jay-Z is one of the few. But everyone else, one hit wonders. How many times, you know, Soldier Boy came and was name dropping brands and bathing apes and things like that became hot. Or Pharrell came along and start name dropping bathing apes and ice cream and things like that in the songs, not in the culture, because, you know, the songs come first and then the magazine articles and the YouTube videos came. Think about it, like really look at the catalog of anything that made it to radio. It was an advertisement. And look at, run it parallel with alcohol sales, run it parallel with uh, something as simple as Dijon Mustard, right? Vox did a whole documentary about why so many rappers said Dijon Mustard, right? Run that parallel with black bottles, run that parallel with Ciroc sales, run that parallel with Effin, right? 50 Cent's another one who leverages this reality coming from the Jimmy Iovine, Dr. Dre, Aftermath, Shady, etc. Everything he does is connected to his music but it's an advertisement for something else, right? Power, he has his own song as the intro. He could have really set song by itself and have been dope, but it's doper because it's the intro to power and you hear it every week and the story of power magnifies that intro. If he just dropped that song by itself, no one would care. Like they don't care about the other singles. So he got smart to that. Now he has another TV show that's not doing as well, but at the end of every show, it's a trailer for another music video. So he's attacking all things at once. And he's been doing this for a very long time with all his branding, whether it's the underwear or the water, or vitamin water, right? Za da 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 for Coca Cola, blah, 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 made a couple bucks, boom. Like, he advertised to you to go check out vitamin water, right? So, a lot of rappers in particular never make it because they never catch on to that. And unless you're selected, they'll never tell you either. So you notice a lot of people come out of nowhere who are very successful because they automatically include that into what they're doing. Prime example right now, Little Pump. Gucci gang, Gucci gang, Gucci gang, Gucci gang, Gucci gang, Gucci gang, Gucci gang. How many times did he say Gucci? Right? That, that's the running joke. And now they're, he's at bidding wars. You think the bidding wars is about his talent, his ability to rap or the beat? Let's get realistic. It's about how effective that song's release and cultural impact was to the youth and the spike in Gucci sales. That's it. Nothing else. Not the length of the song that we debate about. Not the key that the two-step piano was in that we debate about. Not the 808s and the distortion. Not the Zaytoven drum kit. Not big hit beats and all the other littles he worked with. None of that. It's all about Gucci branding and effectiveness. And did that have an impact on stock and sales? Yes, it did. Run the Carfax. So we'll see this. Oh, it's, it's so redundant that at this point, you, you can't even you can't even disagree with me or have any kind of feelings about it because this is the reality. This is what it is, not what we want it to be. And a lot of people come out of the woodwork on the B-list level talking about you know, you should do this, you should do that. But none of them touch on the elephant in the room, which is it doesn't matter how good you are if you're not ready to sell out. That's why you hear so much BS about people wanting to go independent. They don't want to go the independent route. They have to go the independent route. And when they go the independent route, they start stepping on our feet. You understand what I'm saying? So now there's pushback coming down and now there's going to be pushback going up soon. And that's what I was talking about earlier with the window closing. So that's going to manifest because they don't want to play the game or they're too afraid to sell out. 
It's not a choice thing. It's not a morality thing. It's a fear. They're afraid of how far they have to sell out. They, they're afraid of that slippery slope when you figure it out. Pop is always the same four chords. No matter how many times I've said that or anyone else has pointed that out, how many people just refuse to use those chords to do something different? How does that work? When, when did it work? If it's never worked, if the number one person, Dr. Luke in pop music has used the same four chords for over 20 years and has the most billboard play songs and awards, why is anyone doing anything different? Because of the romance part, they're not thinking like this is obviously a program or a mechanism or some research went into this because this is inherited from the Beatles. This is inherited from the Tavistock Institute, the research, the Germans, the Nazis, the 440 Hertz. All of that is part of a bigger game being played on a level outside of our scope of support, outside of our scope of awareness, outside of scope, the scope of the social constructs um, talking points. We normally don't talk about it, so you don't think about it. I talk about it all the time. I just have very few people to talk about it with, but I'm exposing it to the public now. And what I mean is, it's not an evil, negative, Illuminati type thing. It is the side effect of capitalism. That's all it is. The selling out means, are you ready to advertise for us? <laughs> are you, I know you're talented. I know your message is good. I know your producer is really dope, but I, we don't need any of that. We need to know how many bottles can you sell? Do you think you can sell this song? Oh, really? Because think about it. How many, I've seen, well, I've seen two or three rappers say something about the labels no longer giving budgets for music videos, right? Because people have iPhones and stuff and it's cheaper and the budgets are cheaper. Therefore, good music videos are harder to create. So what do they do to resolve that? They either borrow the money from a friend. We know who those friends are with all that money from the streets. Or they go to a brand. Beats by Dre was that brand for a while, right? You put the Beats pill in the intro of the video. We give you a couple of dollars. You can make a real music video save the hassle of going to your label and paying interest back just brand placement but then you look at it deeper than that they say beats by dre because we recognize it on a bigger level but what about on a smaller level what drinks what water what clothes what sneakers right joe budden left everyday struggle because of this conversation right the complex wanted to sell to verizon and not cut them in for being creators but more so Nike was making them wear a certain sneaker every show, right? They gave them free Nikes, but they weren't getting a check for endorsing the Nike brand. And it wasn't verbalized. It was just it on their feet. And therefore, the camera angles on the Complex Everyday Struggle show made sure that you saw their feet and up, whereas on other shows of a similar format are here and up. So why would it be on the ground? Why would you be showing that raggedy table? Why would you be showing those raggedy chairs that Joe Bunny made fun of? is because they're calling attention to their feet, which was the same Nike brand, same logo, same everything. And no matter if they put sponsored by Nike or not, it didn't matter. It helped Nike sell those shoes because of the cultural impact of the show and what was happening. Our, our conscious mind didn't go, this is a Nike advertisement. This is a Nike sponsorship. <laughs> oh God. It gets worse than that, though, but I don't want to beat a dead horse. My point is this. The reason why a lot of us will never, ever make it on that level is because we have no idea how advertising works. We have no idea how business works. We have no idea how the flow of money works. And we have no connection, information, knowledge from the people who do. We just get to see drops of it fall down. And hopefully I'm, I'm helping you see it by putting these pieces together for you. Because I started with the hip hop and the drug culture and all that stuff and all these identities that are stolen from drug lords to sell drugs. But nowadays, in more recent time, you know, all of our rappers and producers got hooked on to Molly, right? Well, if you get hooked on to ecstasy or types of heroin uh, derivatives, um, what, do you, what do you give a person who's addicted to that to get off of it, right? Suboxone and things like that. or uh, you know, just perks and Xanax and, you know, this is running tandem on the music channels. Are you depressed? Be careful. This will increase your risk of suicide on the same music channel that the advertisement is on in the form of a music video. They're running the ads for the cure. 
because they know you can't afford these drugs long term. So you're going to get depressed. And then to answer the depression, instead of you saying, oh, man, I'm depressed because of the side effect of these things being depleted out my brain and on my gut, because your gut actually regulates more of your mood than your brain does. But that's another video. Um, instead of addressing that holistically, you go, I think I'm depressed. I can't get over it. I don't know why I can't get over it. I don't know how to detox. Advertisement comes to save you. Hey, are you feeling kind of blue? The same thing with the Valtrex commercials, right? You know, you have all this promiscuous stuff, like, for instance, Scandal. Scandal's a TV show, Shonda Rhimes, acclaimed, all this, all these advertisements. And the most important impact is that it wants to create feminism in women. And women want to take control of their sexuality and the freedom of their bodies. And during that programming and conditioning, they're running Valtrex commercials or herpes commercials, right? You know, you got a cold sore. It's not because it's winter. It's because you have the herpes complex virus and you have this herpes complex virus because you're being promiscuous and the TV show and the media you're consuming has enabled you and gave you permission to do that. But, they, but don't worry, they got your back. They're going to fix it. It's so it's so deep, but not really. It's I know it's very clear for you to see as I say it, but most people don't think about that on a normal, on a daily. So if you do not <laughs> make music as an artist, that is marketable, you'll never sell millions of records because you're not trying to sell you really. You need to be able to sell the brand or the product. Understand? It's that simple. It's nothing deeper to it. There's no secrets. There's there's really, like I said, knowing is half the battle, right? Knowing how to do these things is half of it. The other half is, are you willing to sell yourself out? That's it. And there's people like me who just weren't willing to. Hence, I have to work longer. I have to work harder. I have to outlive that system and that paradigm. I have to outlive the conditions and my magnet and my law of attraction is creating new circumstances to push me in a different direction where I could prosper, but it would never be the same as if I hit a quick lick with the major industry and advertising firms and sold a million copies and how fast that would elevate me and project me in my personal development because with money comes freedom with freedom comes self-discovery and travel and all these things that make you a better human and given the right context given the awareness of that but i have to do it slower right so a lot of us are doing it slower and not at all even so that's why i give so many hacks this is why i give so many workarounds because i know the reality for most of us is we're gonna have to do it the hard way and the hard way means you're gonna have to become your own brand and the hard way means you have to create your own advertisement. And the hard way means you're gonna to have to identify not your sound as much as your tribe. The, the tribe conversation is twofold. It's one, the people that you resonate with who are gonna help you and support you um, as fans or the thousand. And, you know, there's all kinds of quick ways and cool books and gimmicks, but the reality is who do you relate to? And if you could relate to them, what products do you relate to? So look at my YouTube channel as a template for that. I make beats, I do hip hop, I do trap, I do soul, I do sampling, I do hardware, I do whatever I want to do. My tribe is bigger because I can do FL Studio, I can do Reason, I can do SP44, I can do Lo-Fi. These are all things I'm naturally gifted and attracted to. But most people aren't, most people niche. Some people niche in just Fruity Loops and try to skate around in these other things because they need more people, they need more people to uh, expose their services and ads to and then our culture looks at it like oh they, that's whack that's corny stay in your lane it's not that they care about the program or you they they want you to look at their stuff so that they can sell to you i'm a prime example of that um i make lo-fi um and the business part of me goes dun, dun, dun. i should sell a lo-fi kit it's ingenious that, but that makes sense though. That's my own brand. That's me moving to my own beat, to my own horn. I was gonna make a lo-fi kit anyway. Now I can sell it, offer it to people who may not have these tools or the knowledge or the workflow or even care. They just wanna buy it just to have it, right? There's a lot of that. So I'm not trying to sell you Gatorade ever. I sell kits and courses based on what I'm teaching for free. So I am my own walking, talking brand regardless. 
when I start st stepping out of that and start telling you guys about this hot t-shirt company, or I start talking to you guys about this hot new drink that's coming out, it, you're gonna, it's a red flag is gonna go off. That's how it is for everyone else. And that's how come everyone doing this for the first time, they have a hint that is about advertisement, they're gonna double down on the advertisement and push of a service or a subscription or join this e e exclusive club where we only have two or three materials ready for you and we're gonna drop the ball once we hit our quota, right? They're approaching it from the model that they perceive from the industry, but they don't, they themselves don't know how deep the industry is. Like big pharma is connected to the records, which is connected to the TV, which is connected to your network, which is connected to your cell phone company. They're all boarded by the same people. You having this little small hustle of you trying to sell USB sticks because you have a friend who owns a tech warehouse isn't on the same level or perception of what's really happening. And people miss that. That's the other half. The other half of the battle, the other half of knowledge, the other half of experience, the other half of mastery, the 10,000 hours that we hear about. The other half of it is business. Not your prices, not the website, not Spotify, not iTunes, none of that. The business. Does your music match a culture? Does your music match a lifestyle? Does your music match a brand? And if you're talented enough to do it, why not? And why are you going the hard way trying to bring people into your stuff? Like uh, as far as messages go, if you don't even know if people resonate with that, right? Someone said to me, one of the homies, I think Curtis is saying, he's saying, yo, this emo trap is going to be a thing. Triple X temptation and all this and all this. And, you know, the depressed culture, the people who are addicted to drugs and the youth, um, they're resonating with emo people because of depression, which is a side effect of the collateral damage from earlier forms of music and their big brothers, sisters and parents. So it'll be cool to kind of capitalize that sound and that style in preparation for what that is, which is the grunge and Nirvana. And I've mentioned that in previous videos that that was coming as well. Um, the producer who does Joyner Lucas stuff, uh, Brian Knox. Uh, me and him talked about this a few months ago, that all of this was coming. And it's funny how lo-fi intersects with that as well, which is what I'm doing. Um, it's all in the same, the sad edit, all of it's the same side effect of previous drug advertisement. So when you market this emo stuff, if you're not an emo or if you're not depressed or if you're not on those drugs, how are you going to sell it? Or if you don't have enough field information about what it really is, how can you sell it or target or market or run an ad on it? You're gonna run ads on a project that's uplifting and happy, that sounds grungy, and you're gonna market happy people like you, and they're gonna be like, what the heck are you doing? We don't wanna to listen to that. And you're going to say, without fail, these people over there are doing this. This is coming, believe me. And they're going, no, I'm never listening to that. Because there's a disconnect. Yeah, you're right, those people over there who are not you, are you willing to sacrifice or sell your soul to join that culture? And, and there's a million different ways to chop that up and, you know, adapt. So, oh man, that, that's, that's probably the hardest thing. Like I said, that's not something I can teach because there's too many thoughts and angles and underhandedness and um, untrue things about it because people have to lie to you to get you to comply. People have to sell you the dream to get you to comply because they don't need you. Don't get it messed up. They need you at a good enough price to finish what they're doing. That's it. That's why some of the most successful producers are grandfathered in by a rapper, right? Gucci man adopted all these kids in Atlanta and brought them in and they're kind of, you know, rocking. Jeezy, same thing. Atlanta's culture, you know, bring the next one in, bring the next one in. That's why I say if they form a union together, it would be a disaster because I don't think they understand what this really is to unionize it. You're going to unionize and make sure that producers get paid from the labels, but you're going to register this with the government that mandated these policies. <laughs> what? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. It, it, and you're able to unionize and stay relevant in the current time because it was decided before you even started. Th this this paradigm is going to end, so you're going to union. They run the risk of un unionizing the wrong people in the wrong sound, 
And what's going to happen to them is what happened to our brothers, Pete Rock and everyone else. The time is going to change. The ads are going to change. The paradigm of human society is going to change. And these people who subconsciously been advertising the coding, the lean and the doing drugs are going to be lapped by whatever else is next. And they're going to be like, oh, we don't like this new stuff. They're not staying true to what we used to do. And they're doing it wrong and they're not selling correctly. And not not being aware of the fact that the advertisement changed the 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 adjustments have been made and the goals for society on that level changed so you can't be a good judge of character and who should be in your little group because you don't understand what's happening in the bigger picture again mg the future i i see time different bro like this ain't what we think it is and I just had to get that off my chest because it makes me mad. It makes me mad some of the discussions I see people get caught up in arguing about and reminiscing and staying stuck in the past. But the reality is it's none of those things. Never has been. Ever since the advertisers took over, it's been about advertising. You, we can go deeper than that. We can go darker than that. We can get a little bit riskier than that. But for the sake of YouTube, I'm going to keep uh, most of this conversation um, as a inclination, just a seed in your head so you can think about that and research it further. But on the surface level, the reason why we're not making it or you're not making it or I'm never making it on that level is because we're not willing to sell out to advertisement. Nothing more, nothing less. I'm MG the Future. Until next time, peace.